Okay. Uh, today, in our series on good and faithful, we're looking at this whole topic of prayer, which is really appropriate, seeing as we've got Encounter Week starting tomorrow. Uh, let me just pray and commit it to the Lord. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that we come into the presence of the living God, to the very throne of grace, the very throne of the power of the universe, through the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your spirit, so we have that access. We praise you for your love and your goodness and all your plans for us. And Father, I just want to pray right now that your Holy Spirit would come and touch our hearts, whatever I say will mean nothing unless you move by your spirit. So, Father, touch us with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know how you think about prayer or what your thoughts are coming to the Encounter Week, which is starting uh, tomorrow, five evenings of prayer, the prayer room next door available 24-7. Fasting is something that we encourage during that week as well. I mean, there are no rules to it. Some people will fast from the beginning to the end of the week, um, right through that time. Does it excite you? Does it get you really expectant of what God is going to do? Or do you feel dry this morning as you come into the Lord's presence? I've got one verse that we're going to think about. One verse, we're going to scatter around the, uh, the Bible a bit. But there's one verse that I want us to concentrate on, which should come up behind me. Hebrews 11, verse 6, which says, And without faith it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You might think it's an obvious verse, really. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. How much? This title of this talk is how much do we believe in prayer how much do we really believe it this verse is absolutely crucial whoever comes to God must believe that he exists but when we come into God's presence either on our own at home or here as a group do we really believe that we're coming to the living God might change the way we come <laughs> might change the attitude in our heart, might change how we approach things. If you were going to go and visit the queen, would you just turn up? There'd be a whole lot of things going on in your mind about what am I going to do, what's going to be like, what's she like. We come to the living God. If we met Jesus as John did, in Revelation, that vision, he fell at his feet as though dead. John, who had known him, John, who had leant on his side at the Last Supper, John, who had lived with him for three and a half years, but the risen Jesus, the glory of God, he fell at his feet as though dead. And Jesus had to say, don't be afraid. How much do we believe when we come that we're really going to meet with the living God or is it just something we do is prayer just something we do because it's a routine it's a ritual it's something that we're supposed to do isn't it but if we really believe it's going to change us enormously in how we approach prayer in how we come to God you know, there's a verse in, in Ecclesiastes that says, be careful what you say before God because you are on earth and he's in heaven. <laughs> yeah. You know, <clears throat> a personal testimony is my dad uh, almost died before I was born. 
he had TB back in the day in the 50s when lots of people died of it. And uh, although he had very little sort of faith or anything, he prayed. My sister was already born, but he prayed that if he survived and had a son, he would give that son for God's work. And he completely forgot that until at university, I said, I'm giving up science and I'm going to go out with Operation Mobilization to India. And so then he remembered, you're on earth, he's in heaven. There's a real God who listens to our prayers. Do we really believe it? Whoever comes to God must believe that he exists. Something I say in my flat very often when I'm going through some basic discipleship stuff, when I come to prayer, I say, look, before you leave, if you thought that Jesus as a man was in the next room and he's saying, I've got something to tell you, I want to bless you, I want to bless whoever it is and tell you something about your future, would you say, well, I actually, I'm in a rush. I've got to go because I'm meeting someone. I've got this to do. I've got that to do. You just go off, not meet him? Don't think so. Be terrified, maybe, wondering what on earth is he going to say. But I don't think you'd miss that opportunity. But he is there, not as a man, but he is with us by his spirit. He truly, really is. If you believe it, do you believe it? Is the key. How much do we really believe it? Because we won't miss our daily prayer times. We won't miss time to be with him. An hour in prayer, people say, what? An hour in prayer? An hour in prayer would be nothing if we think we're really meeting with Jesus. If we really think that, if we really believe that, as opposed to it being some kind of mental thing that we hold to because it's just part of our things that we think we ought to do. If we really believe it, prayer is the most wonderful, exciting, glorious thing because you're meeting with God. The God who loves you, the God who made you, the God who knows every hair on your head, who knows every day of your life, who knows the future, the God who has plans for you. May not come up there, I don't know, because I'm going out of order with all the, the, these scriptures, but Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. Do you believe it? If you believe it, it's so exciting. What? God has ordered my life? Just little me? Any of us? Ordered it and prepared it before the world was made? It says earlier in Ephesians that he planned it out. Things that have got my name on it, your name on it, things for you to do. That if it's not done by you, it won't be done in the way he planned for it to be done. He'll get it done somehow because he doesn't ever, his will is never frustrated, but it won't be done the way God planned for it to be done if you don't do it. There's a bit in the Lord of the Rings where Tolkien gets uh, this idea across. Galadriel says to Frodo, the ring has come to you and unless you do it, it won't happen. And that's Tolkien putting in what is a biblical idea that there are things with your name on it. It's so amazing that God, <laughs> you know, we're hopeless, aren't we? All of us. We're all sinners. We all fail. We all do wrong. We all get confused. We're faithless and so forth. But he has got things with your name on it for you to do, which you can find out. He's just waiting to tell us. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will open. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be open. What promises? But do we believe it? Because if we believe it, we're going to be there knocking on that door. I am. <laughs> always, throughout my Christian life, I've always spent time to get alone with God, to fast, pray, because I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out on those things that he prepared for me to do. But if we drift, if we don't ask, the Bible says you don't have because you don't ask. 
If we drift through life, we'll miss it. I don't want to get there, arrive in heaven and have that interview that says we will all have with Jesus and him say, well, Clive, there were so many things that I had planned for you to do, but actually you were too distracted. You didn't want to seek me for them. There they are. That's what would have happened. But it didn't happen. Do we really believe it? If we really believe it, we will seek him with all our heart. We will earnestly, earnestly seek him. It's such a false idea to think that once we come to faith, we just drift through the Christian life because God is a God of grace and he just gives us everything anyway. That would be the equivalent of saying that we needn't bother to be good because God always forgives. No. He said, ask, seek, knock. Actually, the invitations, but it's a command when you think about it as well. Because he wants to give us good gifts. The rest of that passage talks about what father would give his son a stone if he asked for bread or give him a snake if he asked for a fish. God wants to give us good gifts. God delights to give us good gifts. He planned it out ahead. He wants it to happen. It's in his interest. It's in our interest. He has a good and pleasing and perfect plan, the Bible says, for each of our lives. God's will is good and it's pleasing and it's perfect. Well, that sounds exciting to me. <laughs> it's something that we don't want to miss out on. Well, you say, the rest of the verse says we must believe that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You know, the Bible's not above talking about reward. It talks a lot about it, actually. It's a theme. You don't often hear about it because we, again, we focus rightly on salvation and it is a gift and so on. But the Bible talks about treasure in heaven. It talks about reward for those who are faithful again and again and again in parables and all over the place. Because if we don't believe that, it takes away a lot of the incentive, isn't it? Those who come to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If you think there's going to be a reward, that is a real incentive to come. And he knows that, and that's why he's told us that. And you say, well, yeah, we believe it. Just as an aside, if someone ever says to you, Oh, I don't, someone said it to me the other day in the church, actually, a visitor who wasn't a believer and said, oh, I, I don't have a faith. You can say to them, yes, you do. You have a faith every single day in something called money. Money, when you think about it, has no intrinsic value. It's just a piece of paper or plastic or numbers in a machine these days. Nothing to it. There is nothing there, actually. It only works because we all believe in it. If we didn't believe in it, it would just cease to exist. There'd be no value to any of it if we didn't believe in it. For 4,000 years, people used cowrie shells, a type of shell, as an exchange mechanism in Africa and in South Asia. For thousands of years, you could purchase whatever you want with these shells. No one does it now because no one believes in them now. It all worked on faith. If you believed that these shells would get you whatever you needed, then they would. Because everyone believed it. The same with our money system, our financial system. It all entirely works on faith. We stop believing in it, a currency goes, or a bank crashes. It's fragile, really, when you think about it. It all just depends on our faith. So we have faith in that. And, and have faith that it's a reward, that if you have money, you get something for it. So how, much, how does that compare to our faith in God, who is so much, he's real, he's real, and has all power and all strength? So if we said that everyone who comes to an encounter evening next week will get a thousand pounds for every evening they turn up, the church isn't saying that, but 
if it did, if it did, there's a few ears picked up then, whoa, what's, what's happening here? A thousand pounds for every prayer meeting you come to. By the end of the week, you can have 5,000. I think people be queuing out there. Actually, if it got out to the community, what? They're giving away money like that. They'd be turning up. Faith, because the faith is in money. It's only pieces of paper. It's only electronic numbers, but the faith is there that there's a reward. God is eternally powerful, who controls everything, who better so God who controls everything every day of our lives every hair on our head who loves us so much that he came into the world in order to die in our place to save us who loves us that much who wants to bless us what kind of reward is so much better than a thousand pound forget the five thousand pound to meet with God can turn someone's life around just in Five minutes of really meeting with God. So much more valuable. I remember a prayer meeting once in some, I think it was in Sergit's house actually, long, long time ago. Um, and we gathered to pray, just a very few of us, uh, because in those days there were very few of us. And I was leading this prayer meeting and I prayed the, started to pray the opening prayer and suddenly... The Lord's presence was so real in that room to me that I couldn't speak. It was just, he was there. I, thought, I was going to about to pray, and I thought everyone, it was so real to me, I thought all the others could <laughs> experience that as well because it seems so objective. But actually, they didn't, so they're all wondering, why haven't I said anything? <laughs> Why isn't this meeting starting? But when God really touches your heart or touches your life, nothing will ever be the same again. So why aren't we doing more of that? Why aren't we? You know, we, that's why we arrange these three encounter weeks a year. Um, I suppose they've been going about 20 years. That's more than 20 years, could have, isn't it? So maybe 25 years now we've been doing that. Because we wanted to give that chance for the whole church to, to find that. I used to go out and just seek God on the common. Mostly it was just out on the common that I would go and seek God on my own. And one day when I was there, God clearly said in my mind, next time you come, Blit, Clive, bring everyone else. Uh, <laughs> and that, that was one of the times when we started these um, prayer weeks. Because it is so valuable to spend that time in God's presence. Anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. If you can't make it, I mean, it may be that in this next week, <clears throat> you're, you, you know, someone's looking after the kids or whatever it is, but the good news is it's going to be available online. And so you can... Uh, tune in and join in the see the what's going on and it'll break out into a group so you can pray with the people that are there online we did that in the january uh prayer week so even if you can't make it you can still you can still join in um just a passage second kings Second Kings chapter 13. <clears throat> this is the context of this. It's 2 Kings 13, <clears throat> chapter 14. Elisha, the prophet, who God has used massively to protect the kingdom of Israel from its enemies by telling them where the foreign forces were going to be and um, forget the drones, God did it a long time ago through Elisha with, 
with uh, the Arameans and others that were attacking Israel, <clears throat> gave them the intelligence to know where these attacks were going to come from. He is about to die. So King Jehoash comes to him very distraught because um, this information that we're getting through this prophet is going to cease. And this is the little incident there. It's 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 to 19. <clears throat> it says this. Now Elisha was suffering from the illness from which he died. Jehoash, king of Israel, went down to see him and wept over him. My father, my father, he cried, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. How are we going to cope without you? Elisha said, get a bow and some arrows, and he did so. Take the bow in your hands, he said to the king of Israel. When he had taken it, Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. Open the east window, he said, and he opened it. Shoot, Elisha said, and he shot. The Lord's arrow of victory, the arrow of victory over Aram, Elisha declared. You will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Then he said, take the arrows, and the king took them. Elisha told him, strike the ground. He struck it three times and stopped. The man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck the ground five or six times, then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will defeat it only three times. It's a strange little incident, really. But he got angry with him when he only struck the ground three times. He wasn't that enthusiastic. Imagine God gave you a stick and <clears throat> said, that sin you struggle with, that depression, that anxiety, that temptation, the thing that you struggle with all the time, as much as you hit this stick, you will get victory over it. Wow. Wouldn't you really go to town with it? <laughs> with it? To, to if it's a proportionate to how much you use that stick, you'll go crazy to beat the ground with it. That's equivalent to what Elisha was saying to the king. You will defeat Aram, hit, hit the ground with these arrows. He only bothered three times. And therefore, they only defeated them three times. They would have done more. God would have done more for them. The lesson, what is the lesson for us? How much do we believe it? If we really believe it, we'll be passionate. If we really believe that, that hitting that stick would, would get us victory over that temptation, we'd go crazy with it. If we really believe that God rewards those who earnestly seek him, we're going to be passionate about it. It's going to be something we look forward to, something we want to put our time to. Fasting? Forget it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Food is not so important as this. That's what fasting is saying, really. It's, it's a statement to yourself and to God saying, food is not so important to me. And food is a pretty basic thing, isn't it? And it's saying, food is not as important to me as this is. How passionate are we? Is your spiritual life dry? Seek him. Earnestly seek him. He rewards those who do so. But if we don't, if we only hit the ground three times, we only defeat three times. If we're lackluster, if we're lukewarm, if we haven't got that passion because we don't really believe it that much, not much happens. Not much will take place. That is the lesson from Second Kings. That's what, what he's saying in that passage. And God has told us to persevere. A little passage in Luke 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Because that's the other thing. We can be enthusiastic for a while, and then nothing happens and we give up. He said... In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. 
And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. But it doesn't end there. He says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The sad implication of that question is no, he won't. He's giving him strong encouragement and saying, look at some just judge. Look what God will do. How much we should go for it. But will you go for it? We can each make our own decision. We can each make our own choice. I think he's talking about the world generally. The world generally, no, won't go for it, sadly. That's the way it is. It's a bit like when God gave Moses the law, and at the end of Deuteronomy, there's a whole, there's a little bit about what God would do to bless them if they kept the law, and a massive amount about what's going to happen when they don't keep the law, because he knows they're not going to. And I think it's a bit the same here, that generally the world isn't going to go for this. But we can. We can. So we need to, this is an encouragement to keep on praying when nothing happens at first. To keep on seeking God, not to give up. It's, prayer is not always, or even often, answered straight away. Sometimes it is. I remember being on the balcony of a cruise ship. <laughs> Take, having my devotion and just praying to God, Lord, it'd be lovely to see one of your dolphins. <laughs> Dolphin there, straight away. Never saw one before or after on that ship at all, but just at that second. Wow. So sometimes he does, but very often not. It's rare that prayer is answered straight away. It may not be answered at all if certain things are at not happening so we're going to look at the reasons why prayer may not be answered at all so i think we'll come up here now hopefully not straight away but don't give up ah okay and if you go to the first one then thomas yeah it may not be answered at all if we're living in unrepented sin Psalm 66 verse 18 says, if I cherish sin in my heart, God would not have listened. So if don't expect God to answer prayer if you know you're doing wrong and won't turn away from it. You know, even a, even a parent would say to a child, you know, when an ice cream van comes outside and they say, can we have an ice cream? Did you clean your room? No. Well, don't expect to get the ice cream. <laughs> you know, we were familiar with that thing. God will not hear us if we are Deliberately disobeying. Okay, next one. <clears throat> we ask with selfish and worldly motives. If what we're asking for isn't what God wants, but it's actually what we want. It could be in opposition even to what God wants. And if we ask for things like that, God isn't going to hear, isn't going to answer. James chapter 4 verse 3 says, we are. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. You may spend what you get on your pleasures. So Jesus said, ask whatever you will in my name and I will do it. You can't ask for selfish things in the name of Jesus. You can't ask for just the worldly stuff in the name of Jesus. Next one. Yeah, if we lack faith or we're in two minds about it. James 1 verse 7. Uh, it, yeah, it says that man should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. It's previously said he's an unstable person in two minds about things without committing in faith to whatever it is we're praying for. So if those things are there, <clears throat> it isn't going to be answered. But even if they're not there, 
there may be a delay in prayer being answered. And there can be lots and lots of reasons for that, why God would wait <clears throat> to answer our prayers. Um, so if we go to that, Thomas. Yeah, keep going. The first one. Yeah, keep going. We need to change. It could be that, you see, we often think that prayer, sometimes we think that prayer is about sort of getting God to change his mind about something. <laughs> I'm sure that makes him laugh, makes me laugh. The, the prayer is not about getting God to change his mind. He knows what he's doing. Prayer is about getting us into line with God's will. <clears throat> Someone described it once as, if you are in a boat moored to a dock and you pull on the rope, you are not pulling the dock nearer to you. You're pulling your boat nearer to the dock. When we pray... When we really pray, filled with God's spirit, it's about God changing us to be more in line with what he's going to do anyway. He's got his plan. It's out there and it's changing us to take part in it. So we may need to change in our attitude, in our expectation, in all kinds of ways. And as we pray, God will be working on us to say, come on, Clive, no, no, that isn't it. That isn't what I wanted you to do anyway. Why are you talking to me about that? Someone once said, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. You know, it's, it's not something that we bring to God. He may need to change us in our thinking. And when it talks about finding God's will in Romans 12, it says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. We have to be changed sometimes in our thinking to be in line with God's will. Secondly, there may be long-term issues involved that, again, God wants to get, get us to work on, to get right before he can answer whatever we're praying about. Maybe temptations we're struggling with, other kind of character traits that God wants to get sorted out in us before he can give us whatever else we're praying about. Okay, next one. Are we really serious that's another reason I believe God waits to answer prayer. Because if you pray once and it doesn't happen, oh, all right, I give up. Well, that wasn't very serious. It wasn't something that you were really committed to. If, if a, a young man asked a, a very rich dad or a young daughter asked for a grand piano, say, it would be quite foolish probably for the parent to just say, okay, I'll spend however many thousands on the grand piano then they play it for a few months and lose interest. But if they were to keep asking <clears throat> and maybe get a little job to put some money towards it, then the parent might think, yeah, they're really serious about this. And it's something that we can, uh, you know, really go for. So sometimes it's seeing, are we really serious about it? Okay, next one. Other people's free will. This is particularly true if you're praying for people to get saved. God doesn't use your prayers to override their free will. God doesn't override free will. We're not puppets in that sense. God is in control of all things, but you, you do not sort of get to have your choice make someone else's choice. So people's free will comes into it as well. Um, and finally, on this one, not yet God's time, that he knows there's circumstances involved in one way or another that mean that it's better to wait. An example of that <clears throat> is this building. Uh, November 2009, God put it on our hearts to pray for a bigger building. Um, it was 10 years later that we opened it. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, just over 10 years later, because it's March 2020, so just over 10 years. And in that time, when we are <clears throat> through that 10 years, I know, and some people here know, that some people didn't believe it would ever happen, actually. But we needed to persevere 
in prayer. But how can you persevere in something like that when it takes years and years and years and years? We need to be sure that what we're praying for is God's will in the first place. And with this building, the, the very day after Kulib and I decided that we would uh, go for it in prayer, someone gave £20,000 to the work out of the blue, someone who hadn't given before, and twice the normal, the, twice the biggest ever gift we'd ever had before the next day. <laughs> so that was a pretty good sign. And then there were other people. There was uh, Donya, that so some of you know, that out of the blue suddenly said to us, every time she passes this building, she's been praying that we would get this. No, we hadn't said it to anyone. There was Mary, Malcolm's wife, who had a, a dream, a vision of us having this building when before we had said it to anyone. So God gave us different uh, encouragements to, to know that this was his will which kept us going for the 10 years, <laughs> seven years till we got it, and then another three to do it up. So as we come to <clears throat> the end of all this, actually one thing I must say is that when it did happen, such God's perfect timing in the finances that we had the money that we needed, because it took the years, we had years to save up. Such perfect timing in that we have one meeting here before the lockdown in 2020, um, which seemed incredible at the time because we had 10 years and then we had one meeting and then there's a lockdown. But it meant that when we started again, we could socially distance. The little hall in there would never have coped with it in terms of the social distancing that was needed um, when the lockdown happened. So it really was God's perfect timing for this place, even though we had to wait and keep faithful in prayer. So as we come to the end of this talk, I always think of Jesus sitting with the woman at the well. She doesn't know who she's sitting with. And he says, if you only knew who it is you're talking to and the gift of God, you would ask me and I would give you living water. How often is God thinking about that, about us? If only you believed it more, if only you knew who it is and the gift of God, you would ask. And as we come to, to pray at the end, if we don't have that faith to believe that God rewards those who seek him, to seek his will and what he wants in our lives, then we won't be enthusiastic about prayer. Our spiritual lives will remain dry. So let's pray for God's grace as we come to an end now. Father, we, we thank you that you are here that by your spirit you hear every word we say in prayer, every thought in our heart, that you love us far more than we understand. Lord, grant us the grace to open our eyes afresh to who it is that we're talking to and to the gift of God that we might ask and you would give us living water. In Jesus' name, amen. There will be a prayer team available for people who want prayer. And there are some books. I don't often do this, but I felt today I should. The story of what God did in answer to prayer for starting this work, year after year of miracle after miracle of financial support, plus 10 testimonies of Hindu Sikhs and Muslims who found faith, is in this little book, Light Out of Darkness basic book about the Christian life a fifth of it is on prayer built on the rock and really important God rewards those who seek him a whole book on treasure in heaven how much do you know about treasure in heaven how many sermons have you ever heard about treasure in heaven how many bible studies have you done how much do you know what the bible says about the reward that God promises to those who earnestly seek him 
You can have all three for £10. They're going to be available at the back. Uh, and the proceeds will go to Young Life for Ria's support um, as we're collecting for her uh, this month.